Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to begin our study of chemistry and start on atomic theory or our understanding of atoms and how that has developed over time to the models that we use today. So we can go ahead and get started here. First thing we're going to look at is Dalton's atomic theory. And that states that matter is made up of atoms. So atoms have been thought of for a long time, but it's not something that we have to have really known the exact details of. So how small can we divide something? So if we take a copper coin here and we then divide it up, the smallest individual piece that retains that property is the atom. So if you try to subdivide an atom, then you are changing. You no longer have the property of carbon in it anymore. But in this case, you would still have each carbon atom would still have those same properties. So it is the smallest unit that participates in a chemical change. And it consists an element that we'll look at consists of exactly one type of atom. So when we look at carbon, we're talking about only carbon atoms. Now that doesn't actually apply for using a copper scent here because a, a copper scent actually has a little bit of mixture of a couple of other metals in it as well. And they were actually only mainly copper until pre before 1982. More recent ones have far more zinc in them uh, being a cheaper metal with which to be able to make the coins. But what we're going to find is that atoms of one element, their properties are different. So we have different properties as compared to those of other elements. Now, we can also look a compound. Some, there are compounds. Now a compound contains two or more elements combined in a small whole number ratio, meaning they're not fractionally. So there could be one of this and two of that, or one and three, or two and three, but they are going to be whole number ratios when we look at them. And when we look at chemical changes, so until we come to the last unit here, when we look at a little bit about nuclear chemistry, we are going to say that atoms cannot be created or destroyed. So you're not going to destroy any atoms. Well, all we're going to do is all we're doing at this point is rearranging them to yield a new substance. And we can do that in a couple of ways here, for example, is a copper oxide where copper and oxygen are combined together. So that gives us a specific compound and it has a specific ratio of carbon, uh, sorry, of copper to oxygen atoms. However, if we have other components, we can also make things sometimes in different ways. So here we have copper and oxygen as well. Here they're separated but we can combine them together to make copper oxide. So we've changed here metallic copper, um, an element into a compound. So we have two separate elements, oxygen in the air, copper in the solid piece of copper here. And that becomes copper oxide where the atoms of the oxygen end up combined with the atoms of the carbon, making a new compound. Now let's look at one example of this and what we see. First of all, would this example here we have an example looking at we have these two green atoms, these two blue atoms, and we combine them to make a blue and a green. Now, would this violate Dalton's rules that we've looked at? And that that definitely would because we have two green atoms here and two blue but now we only have one of each. So where did the other atoms go? Well, we cannot create or destroy atoms. However, we can look at it this way. For example, we could take several atoms and make them into something different. We can take four green atoms, two blue atoms, and make a compound, uh, two of these, which contain two green and one blue atoms. Now if we look we have four green atoms and they can each match up. We have not created nor destroyed any atoms. They're all still there. So there are our four green atoms and we have our two blue atoms here. This one and this one. 
and the number of atoms of each type is conserved. So it's not just the number of atoms, it is the total number of atoms of each type. So for example, if this green were hydrogen, and this were oxygen, and we're making water H2O, two hydrogens and an oxygen, you cannot convert a hydrogen atom into an oxygen atom. They have to stay exactly the same. So you have the same number of each type of atom on each side when a reaction occurs. Now, one of the things we want to look at as well is what we call the law of definite proportions. And this states that the number of atoms, atoms of the elements in a given compound always exist in the same ratio. So if we are looking at a specific compound, in this case, what is called isooctane, and this is composed of carbon and hydrogen. So if we want to check if these are the same compound, well, we look, this one has so many grams of carbon, this one has a different amount, and this one has a different amount, and three different amounts of hydrogen. Well, are they the same compound? We set up the mass ratio. We look at the mass of carbon divided by the mass of hydrogen for each. And then we divide them to get the simplest whole number. So if we want to make it per gram of hydrogen, we divide here 14.82 by 2.78 and get 5.33. If you divide 22.33 by 4.19, we also get 5.33. And same for the last one. So we always get the same ratio. That's telling us that, yes, these are all the same compound. If you get different ratios, then that means you may have a different compound there. You could have different compounds, which still could be composed of carbon and hydrogen. Now, we can look at an example of this here where we might get some things that are different. And when two atoms react to form more than one compound, so if they can form different compounds, in this case, you can form by combining copper and chlorine, you can form a green compound or a brown compound, depending on how those atoms combine. So we can get the uh, materials, we will find out how they will react. And a fixed mass of one will react with the masses of other elements in small whole numbers. So there are always small whole number ratios between them, even when we are looking at different compounds. And for example, in the green solid, you have 1.116 grams of chlorine. And in the brown solid, you have 0.558 grams of chlorine. And you may be able to guess that these are differed by just a factor of two. So there is a factor of two between these for for what we have for one gram of copper. Now, here's an example. Let's go ahead and look at another example of this. Compound A has 4.27 grams of carbon and 5.69 grams of oxygen. Compound B has 5.19 grams of carbon and 13.84 grams of oxygen. Now we can divide those. So compound A is 5.69 grams. And uh, compound A of, of oxygen. And it has 4.27 grams of carbon. Now in compound B, we have 13.84 grams of oxygen and 5.19 grams of carbon. So if we divide these, we find that compound A is 1.33 grams of oxygen per gram of carbon. Compound B is 2.67 grams of oxygen per grams of carbon. Now the first thing we know, the ratios are not the same. So these are different compounds. These are not the same thing. So these are not equal to each other. They are different compounds. But when we divide them, when we compare those two ratios themselves and actually divide the two ratios, we can divide this ratio 1.33 by this one that's 
and we get one half. We're always going to get something that is a very simple whole number ratio. And in this case, we're seeing that one has a lot more oxygen than the other, so that this first compound A, so compound A is carbon monoxide, carbon and oxygen. And note that the number of atoms will be the same, but the masses are different. And we'll go through how the masses vary, but the mass of each element is a little bit different. For this one, we have a lot more oxygen, so compound B is carbon dioxide. So they are two very different compounds as we saw because the ratios were not the same. But there is still a very very distinct ratio between the two. And we see in this case that it is that one has twice as much oxygen as the other. Now we want to go back a little bit and look at the development of this atomic theory. And one of the things we measured early on was trying to measure the mass of the electron. So this took some time to be able to do and was done in parts. In fact, Thompson used a cathode ray tube such as the one shown here that to use to measure the mass of the electron. So the charge to mass ratio, he couldn't measure either one, but he could measure their ratio by sending them through here through these plates and being able to measure that. And what was found was it was 1.759 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. So that told us the ratio of charge to mass. Millikan did an oil drop experiment and the oil drop experiment something like this here where oil droplets were sprayed through the x-rays produced charges on those droplets and then you had plates and you could adjust the charge of those plates to allow to keep the oil droplets suspended and that allowed us to determine the actual charge on the electron of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs now if we put these two together we know the charge to mass ratio and now we know the actual charge, we can combine these to get the mass of the electron. And the mass of the electron is just the charge multiplied by the charge to mass ratio, or we should say the mass to charge ratio will invert that. And that would mean that our units of charge coulombs would cancel and we would get an answer in kilograms of 9.107 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. So that was a determination of the mass of the electron. And we can see it's an incredibly small number. So the mass of an electron, you put, put the decimal point there and a whole bunch of zeros because you've got to go 31 places over and then you will start getting other numbers. So that is so gives an idea of how tiny that mass of an electron would be. Now we're still trying to determine models and we'll go over a little bit more of this uh, coming up. But what were some of the models that were used? Well, there were things like what was called the plum pudding model, where electrons were embedded in a positively charged mass. So you had a great mass here of material that was positive, and you had little negatively charged electrons scattered through it. So kind of like bits of material within a pudding there, but those were the electrons and the, everything else was all positively charged. So that was one thought that it was one solid piece of matter. And of course, there would be many millions and billions of these. Or we could look at a Saturn like atom, Saturn being the ringed planet where you had a positively charged nucleus and electrons that then orbited around that. So you could make up an atom like that. And we see some remnants in this in our models that we still use today. So what we found, what experiments have been done, and we've been able to find using Rutherford experiment that was done. And what was found was that the volume was almost all empty space. So we needed a source of particles here that were sent out. These are alpha particles, which are actually a helium nucleus. So this is actually the nucleus of helium, which were then beamed through into this thin piece of gold foil. And what was found was that 
Most of them traveled straight through and hit right behind. However, others were deviated a little bit, but occasionally ones were reflected almost straight back. Now that was very interesting because depending on the model that you use, that means that really the actual mass material within that gold foil was very, very spread out and that really anything that we have is almost all empty space. And in fact, probably looks something like this. And we see that here. So what might have happened? Well, as those particles went through, most of them just zipped right through, not close to the nucleus of an atom and just zipped right through it. But if you came very close and almost head on towards that nucleus, then the positively charged alpha particle coming close to the positively charged nucleus would be repelled and pushed off at a very high angle. Now that's really it would be amazing as you send these things in there to have them reflected almost back at you by this flimsy little piece of gold foil gives us some idea of how concentrated that material is. So this is when we kind of learned that atoms are mostly empty space and that there is a small small heavy positively charged nucleus at the center but it's very tiny. And in fact, to scale, uh, an example could be if you take the seed of a grape and put it at the center of a football field, that would be the simulation of the nucleus and the electrons would then be orbiting outside the edge of the football field. That's an idea of how much empty space there is within an atom. It is almost all empty space. That space is taken up by the electrons. But as you recall, those had almost no mass. Now, a couple of other terms that we want to introduce that we'll be talking about later on are isotopes. Isotopes were thought maybe to be new elements and started to be found in the early 1900s, but are found that they are really the same material with just different mass. For example, we have carbon 12, which is the standard carbon that makes up our bodies. But there's also different isotopes, including carbon 14, which is radioactive and used to actually date things that were at one point living. So things that were made of paper that might have been made from a tree. So there are different isotopes. Chemically, they both behave like carbon, but they have different masses. And this is explained with the discovery of the neutron. The neutron was discovered in 1932 and explains the existence of these isotopes. Isotopes will have the identical number of protons. In the case of carbon, it would have six protons and six neutrons for carbon 12. Carbon 14, because it's carbon, would also have six protons, but would have eight neutrons. So it has a higher mass. It behaves chemically, it will behave essentially the same. But in terms of its mass, it almost looks like a slightly different element. So let's go ahead and finish up here with our summary. And what we find is that really Dalton gave us the beginnings of our modern atomic theory. We looked at the laws of definite and multiple proportions to decide how atoms combine in specific ratios. And finally, Rutherford's experiment explained atoms as mostly empty space with a massive compact nucleus. So that concludes this lecture on atomic theory. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day, everyone, and I will see you in class.